And we'll just go right along. We're up to um, sutra number 227. And now we go and we're beginning the uh, yamas and the niyamas is where we're going to be in just a moment. Number 227 says, one's wisdom is the final, st- one's wisdom in the final stage is sevenfold. That's all that Patanjali says. And then we have Beta Vyasa in his commentary lists what these seven attainments are. The seeker has no need to know anything more. The cause of all suffering having been understood, suffering itself is gradually eliminated. Attaining samadhi, one finally eliminates every cause of suffering. That was number three. Number four, he attains complete discrimination, requiring no further effort in, the, in that direction. Number five, sattva guna, becomes predominant in the mind. Number six, in the sixth stage, the three gunas fall away, and the chitta, subtle feeling, becomes calm. And finally, in the seventh stage, only the self remains. So one's wisdom in the final stage is sevenfold. Patanjali doesn't bother to tell us what that is, but Vyasa intuits it and tells us. Okay, this is actually really extremely interesting when you go back to uh, when Master first came to America and he brought with him a book that he had outlined and then he had his disciple Dhirananda write in English. He didn't actually write the book himself, but he outlined the ideas. And it was his... Um, when, when you think of it in very practical terms, Master's in his 20s, He's coming to America. Of course, you know, he, he knew the trajectory of his life, but nonetheless, the story that he plays out, he has this vision of all these faces and he recognizes them as Americans. And Babaji had said that he, there were potential saints in Europe and America waiting to be awakened. Master then goes to Sri Yukteswar and asks him if indeed he should come to America. He receives an invitation to come to the Congress of a uni- unity of religions, and when he get, try, goes to master again, to his master, Sri Yukteswar, Sri Yukteswar says, all doors are open. It's now or never. You know, this is your destiny. You must follow it. So now, master is playing the role of an ordinary person. Um, I think I've referred to entry number 99 of Conversations with Yogananda, which is an absolutely fascinating entry. Um, I'll review it just in the context here. He, um, it starts out with Master telling the other monks, the monks, and all the monastics there, that if, if somebody does something that really jeopardizes their way of life, that they should tell Master about it. And then it goes on to have some monks tattle that somebody got an ice cream. And Master says, I'm not asking you for just little things, but if they really do something that jeopardizes their way of life. I mean, you can imagine such a thing. Maybe a, a, a young monk starts carousing. Maybe the men and women are coming together in ways that aren't appropriate. Maybe somebody starts taking up drink or something that's really, I mean, something serious. He says, if it's serious, if it really threatens our way of life, then I want to hear about it. And then Master goes on. Swami's quoting him exactly. You may think, oh, he already knows. And then Master writes, God knows everything but sometimes he's silent, and I don't know until you tell me. And then he, and then he says further, he said, I have a dual role to play. On one side, I have that consciousness, and on the other side, I don't. He said, it's not always easy to play both roles. He said, but I do my best. I, it's, just, it's just the oddest entry, number 99, go read it. On the right-hand page, the second paragraph, extremely interesting because of just the way he describes it. You have to help me. You have to participate. And then he also talks about them taking responsibility, which is a different issue. But just those few sentences about his consciousness. I mean, we lived with Swamiji all these years, and he never acted like like it was a done deal, like the story was known. He always acted like every single time it had to be faced and it had to be done. And... Master does really talk about that. It's a lot in conversations and even in uh, the essence of self-realization, too. It's like Jesus really lived as a man among men. 
And Master even puts it that when Jesus said at the end, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Or he was calling for his guru, some say. He was calling for Elijah. That that, that really happened because on that side, he didn't know everything. And there was a moment of whatever. I, it's beyond me to understand. But it does happen, and we see that acted out. And Master's saying to the monks, it's a mistake for you to imagine that you can just be passive because I've got it covered. And I know that Swamiji would reprimand us sometimes for just being too passive and not participating with him enough. When he was first writing The Path, um, he would have us over every Thursday night for a satsang, and he would read to us the chapters that he'd written. And, he, and then he would say, well, what do you think? And a few people would make comments, but many times everybody just sat there and stared at him and said nothing. And I remember finally he became very um, uh, strong. He said, you're, you're treating me like a television or like a jute box where you just put money in and I just keep putting out energy. He said, I need you to give me energy back. I'm reading this to you. I want you to know what you think. Does it work? Do you like it? And he, he really reprimanded everyone for just taking it in without giving anything back. And I mean, he, Swami said to me once, I have to get my energy from somewhere, is how he put it. He said, yes, I can get a lot of it inside from Divine Mother, but I also need help. I need, I need people to participate with me in what I'm trying to do. Now, I'm saying all that because it's, it's, um, it, it's an interesting and I think an important exercise to really feel what Master was doing when he came to America. That's where I was coming back to with this. Because that also helps us to understand that we can't just, we have to participate in this life and we have to participate in this mission. We can't just, as I said, be passive and leave it to him. He participated in the mission. And so there he is. He's a young man. He's in, uh, he's in his 20s. <clears throat> I mean, he was really young, if you think about it like that. And very um, dynamic and uh, and he's coming all the way to America, which was a very uncommon thing to do at that time. We, I found recently a, a picture, somebody offered, offered it to me, that is a blow-up of Master's face taken from a big portrait that looks like it was the raunchy school. So those are the years. I, I have to see what can be done with the picture. It's kind of scratchy. He looks just like Jesus big hair like this, big beard like that, big, big dark eyes. You don't even really at first realize that it's Master. We compared it with the picture of Master as a young boy standing behind his brother, behind Ananta, which is in the biography of Yogananda, because Master's face was very different, you know. Like all of us, when you age, your face fills out more and the, the lines become less angular. It's a very interesting picture. I don't want to say he looks just like Jesus, but he looks surprisingly like that picture of Jesus. That was, it was a fascinating study. But also looking at that, you realize, um, remember Master said to him, you can have long hair, or you can have a, or one of his advisors said, you can have long hair, or you can have a beard, but you can't have both. Well, when you see this picture of his beard, I mean, it was a you know, huge, long, black beard like that and really thick black hair. So... You can see why they said you can have one or the other, but you really can't have both because he just looked so, um, so different, so extremely different. So he's coming to this country and he's trying to think, you know, I can't take, and he didn't want to take Hinduism. He didn't want to take gods and statues and pujas and rituals and Sanskrit prayers. I mean, he knew that wasn't his mission. He was supposed to teach the unity between uh, Krishna and Jesus' teachings and where do you find that unity? I mean, really, how do you find that, especially in a country that is essentially never heard of it? I mean, the reality that we live in now has no relationship to the reality that Master lived in. You know, to even be a, a, a Swami was just so strange, or a dark-skinned a dark Indian was completely strange. And he had to think about, how am I going to get across this bridge? So he had this idea, which is the book he outlined. This is how Swamiji explained to us that that book came to be written. It's still published. It's called The Science of Religion. 
Swami, as Swamiji said, he always had loved the ideas and didn't like the writing. He said it never felt like master. And much later on, after he'd been in SR for a while, he found out that, in fact, it was not Master's writing, it was Dhirananda's writing, who later left and became a college professor. So it has a sort of a, a academic kind of quality to it. But Swami, the ideas are revolutionary, and Swami rewrote it as God is for everyone. He would have rewritten as the science of religion, but we were strongly informed by our attorneys that that was a really bad idea. <laughs> so we didn't. In fact, he wanted to make it by Yogananda. We were strongly informed by our attorneys that that was not a good idea. So he changed the name and it says something about inspired by or something. But the essential point was a very simple one and it became Master's message all the way through. Everyone is motivated by two desires. The desire to experience happiness, which is really a reflection of the desire to experience bliss, and the desire to escape suffering. And all of spiritual life, everything in, about life, but especially everything about spiritual life, can actually be reduced to those two questions. Because what is it that causes suffering, and where is bliss to be found? I mean, the whole of Patanjali that we've just been running through, how many pages are about suffering, 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 and about ignorance, and about its opposite, which is the lack of suffering or the discovery of the divine bliss within. So he explained that out because he could see that that simple thought completely uh, dissolves all differences among all human beings, cultures, countries, and everything. So here he says, Patanjali says, or Beta Bias on behalf of Patanjali, um, number one, the seeker has no need to know anything more. Um, the cause of all suffering having been understood. Isn't that interesting? Because once you know what's causing you suffering, you don't need to know anything else because you have solved half of the issue. Of course, the other teaching, and this is why Swami called, ended up calling the book God is for everyone, because God, as Satchitananda, not as some dog, dogmatic version of, but Satchitananda, ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever new bliss is for everyone. And it's just so self-evident. Who doesn't want to be happy? Who doesn't want to overcome the threat of death? Who doesn't want to be ever inspired and ever uh, able to, not merely to be inspired, but to be aware of being inspired? That's why ever, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new joy. That it never ends, and we're always there to enjoy it. And it's... it's uh, constantly renewing itself. So the other, the side of that is that once we remove the causes of suffering, the bliss is spontaneous. And that's why he says all through this book, Patanjali says repeatedly, ignorance causes suffering, ignorance causes suffering, ignorance causes suffering. We don't understand properly. Once we do understand properly, well, then there's nothing more to know. So one's wisdom in the final stage is sevenfold. First is the seeker has no need to know anything more the cause of all suffering having been understood. I know this also, um, when one looks back on one's life, even before you come on the path, you see how the samskars were at play. Um, through my first 18 years, um, I could never really get interested in anything. <laughs> Because it seemed to me that the question was to figure out, I put it in the positive, how to be happy. And I really couldn't see the point of learning all those other things. Um, it, I was a little lazy, too. That was also part of it, that I could have just been a little more industrious and acquired a few more useful skills for the, the life I ended up living. But still, it just seemed so obvious to me. What's, what's the problem here? Let's sort out the problem. And nobody tried to teach us that. But once it's settled, you, you've understood everything. Number two... Um, let's see, suffering itself, let's see, let me just get this right. There's no need to know anything more. The cause of all suffering having been understood, suffering itself is gradually eliminated. That's just, it's, I think that's an interesting phrase, though. It's only gradually eliminated. That's probably being because even once you have the perception 
of freedom, the karma, the residual karma has to play itself out. There's no reference to being a Jeevan Mukta, but that's probably what's there, that the karma finishes, but you don't really need to understand anymore. You can just let it play. Attaining samadhi, one finally eliminates every cause of suffering. So we first we've understood where suffering comes from, then suffering gradually ceases, and then when we attain oneness with the divine in samadhi, every cause of suffering is eliminated. That would mean that once the ego is completely dissolved and there's no separate self, that being the fundamental cause, uh, it would all be over. He attains complete discrimination, requiring no further effort in that direction. I love that phrase. No further effort. Before we were talking about conscious, continuous effort, wasn't it? Uninterrupted conscious discrimination. But it's not required anymore because we just it's automatic. This, to me, reminds me of how many times I've mentioned to you that I have thought that Swami had a good attitude or a lot of self-discipline, and I've realized that he simply has a completely different perception. And perceiving things completely differently, a whole, a whole response naturally follows in which there is no necessity to discriminate as to what is the right action. It's just com- a completely spontaneous response. And this is our, our personal progress, and it's important to realize that. That's why Master says merely to be nice or to behave properly is not freedom. Freedom is when there's no uh, dissonant impulse left, that the perception of reality is completely shifted. This is why when that man said to Ananda Ma, if everyone in the world strived for goodness, would this world... Wouldn't, would this world become a perfect place? And she answered, but it already is perfect. Because she perceived it as a perfect um, opportunity for everyone to experience God. And as as I said when I talked about that, just depend on what, what the point of the game is. Whether it's doing its job properly depends on what the goal is. And Amananda Moyama saw it as the goal to liberate us from our delusion. And in that sense, the world is perfect set up to teach us um, discrimination and where suffering comes from. And so we don't have to discriminate anymore at a certain point. We just realize that it's, everything's happening as it ought to happen. There's no response. There's no reaction. I, uh, I'm repeating a story here, but it was, very, it was very intense when it happened, when Swamiji was having a lot of troubles, physical troubles, enormous troubles, and he was spared some small difficulty. Like, as I don't even know what it was, whether it was cavities in his teeth or what it was. And I actually said that that common phrase, thank the Lord for little favors, remember? And he reprimanded me very sternly. He just would not, he he wasn't bargaining with God. You know, everything was a great favor from God. There was no, even as a joke, he just wouldn't let it stand. I mean, he just absolutely cut it off and was very stern about it. But he was also showing me, don't, don't think like that. Don't think that I like this and I don't like that, that this is from God and that is not, and God likes me more because he pleased my desires. It's not at all what we're having. So he says, he attains complete discrimination, requiring no further effort in that direction. Everything looks like God at that point. Everything looks like the hand of God. Imagine the freedom. And you can read it a little bit and just sort of, uh, gives you an idea of which direction to practice. Uh, Swamiji talks in some of the next sutras here about the fact that this Patanjali is not practices. Patanjali is just describing what happens. But we can move back from that and take some of these um, end results, inevitable results of right consciousness, and imagine just a little bit about how to practice. Instead of taking everything apart, what if we just see it for what it is when it comes? No discipline required. It's, isn't, it's just such a joke because we're so, we are so habitually carving the world up into likes and dislikes, just endlessly, aren't we? You know, I, sometimes it's like, oh, I have something else to do. I hope there's some emails. <laughs> you know, and sometimes I think, oh, I have something else to do. I hope there are no emails. I mean, there's always some little thought, isn't there? Oh, is there a ripe banana in the kitchen? Oh, no bananas. You know, just like the mind is constantly saying this is good and this is not good, this is good and this is not good, and is always responding to that reality or reacting worse. But just imagine if there was just this complete 
relaxation, whatever it is. It doesn't make any difference. It just, whatever comes is exactly what's meant to be there. That's the end of all suffering. No further discrimination is required. Um, Sattva guna becomes predominant in the mind. That means always calm, always uplifted. And then we go beyond that. In the sixth stage, the gunas completely fall away. We have no relationship to the ups and downs. First, we enter into a completely calm state living in this world, and then the consciousness simply transcends it. We were talking about that earlier. Three, three guna rahitam, transcending the gunas altogether, no longer identified at all with the fluctuating universe, but just living in the infinite. Um, and then the feeling of the heart becomes c- calm, and then only the self remains. Isn't that sweet? I love it. Okay. Any other any comments or thoughts? Yes, Tom, give him the microphone. <coughs> Try it, see if it's on. <coughs> I love this. We have people in this room who have complicated and responsible jobs, and yet that Microphone foils us week after week after week. Okay, I hate to ask this, but uh-huh. he keeps mentioning the mind. I don't know what the mind is. He mentioned the mind there a couple times. Becomes predominant in the mind. So what's the mind? Oh, um, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's your experience. I mean, you, you wouldn't understand the sutra anymore for knowing that, but it becomes predominant in the mind and uh, the field of consciousness. It's just a level of consciousness. Kind it's a of. level of consciousness. Yeah. I don't know how to define it better than that. I'm sure it can be defined, but not by me. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Um, Saran, you're back at this side. I may be picking this apart, but let me ask anyway. So when the person reaches this level where they themselves are uh, in a state of uh, no longer needing to discriminate between good or bad or reaches a state of samadhi, that their experience of the world is one of peace and acceptance. When the person reaches that point where they accept whatever happens is from God, and they, you know, so they're at peace in that sense. Does that also imply that all of their actions are correct? God inspired, yes, of course. There's no self to be separated. You're just in the flow of the infinite at that point. Correct, in the sense of not, you're not subject to the thwarting cross currents of ego, which cause motivation, you to be motivated. You're, you're no longer, you, there's no longer a small self that has to be protected and guided. So you don't make decisions. You don't make decisions anymore that protect your separation. You just live in the unity and everything happens from that unity. Does that make sense? But could their perceptions, could their actions be perceived as incorrect from other people? Well, of you know, course. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah. In the Tolkien, is it in the Tolkien books that it says, beware of judging the actions of a wizard? <laughs> you <can laughs> You just can't tell. You don't know what they're doing. People misunderstand what the great souls are doing all the time. I remember, uh, I mean, just this is just a tiny one, but uh, when Swamiji, uh, when uh, Oliver Black was being, I don't remember why Master did this, but this is a story that's told that Master saw a line of ants and just stomped them all out, just killed them like that. And Oliver Black was just horrified. And Master looked at Oliver and he said, Oliver, it was their time to go. (laughs) I mean, somebody watching that would think has lost his mind. Swami tells the strange story of when he, when Master warned them that they needed to kill rattlesnakes around the desert retreat. And Swami saw a snake and he, he, you know, painfully but dutifully killed it. And then a few days later, Master commented that the nuns were so ill-informed that they just killed a common garter snake the other day. And Swami realized that he'd killed a common garter snake, that it wasn't a a danger at all. And he said he felt very bad about it because he'd taken the life of this innocent creature. And he said a few days later, Master 
sent him out with pots of boiling water and had, them pour them, had him pour the water down ant hills to protect the master's house from ants. And Swami said, you know, those ants pose no threat at all to master's house. But Swamiji felt in a very subtle way, master was trying to ease his anxiety about having taken an innocent life. That it's all right, look, I'm just going to murder all these ants. You don't have to worry about these little things. It's, it's kind of a strange story, but that's, that was how Swami really felt that was what Master was doing. He was just trying to ease him away from being oversensitive and, and misunderstanding and think it was such a terrible thing. An innocent mistake like that was such a terrible thing. You can see how the mind can become obsessed by things like that. Uh, you know, I can easily see it. Oh, I killed the snake, I killed the snake, I killed the snake. And it begins to become this huge thing in your mind. Master just goes and, you know, murders a few million ants. You know, these things come and go. Don't worry about it. Interesting, yeah. So if, um, if karma depends as much or more on the consciousness with which you do something as the actual action itself, then um, does the karma you get for an action change when you start feeling guilty about it? Because one would say that, like, he didn't... He wasn't trying to go out and kill an innocent animal. He thought it was an actual danger, maybe, and, and he unknowingly got the wrong kind of snake or whatever. You would think that would not be as bad karma. Does that change when he starts agonizing about it? And What and he gets then is the karma. It has nothing to do with the dead snake at that point. It has entirely to do with an exaggerated sense of egoic responsibility for the things that happen. So he gets a completely different kind of karma. Guilt doesn't, is not... Guilt is not the balancing attitude to wrong action. The balancing attitude to wrong action is calm, clear discrimination, and the calm resolution to live better the next time. I mean, that's, uh, that's how Swami would, because he had, to, he had to work with me and a few of my close friends about that quite a lot. He said, you've made a mistake. Look it squarely in the face. Don't run away from it. Don't justify it. See what you can learn from it, and then forget it. Period. Because otherwise, you've just carried it on and on. So that's why Master was trying to get him, just let it go. You made a mistake, there it is. Next time, look more closely at the tail. Okay. But then to think that the death of this snake is such a big thing in my life, and what's going to happen to me next? I mean, if, if you were going out like, Master, like Swami describes in the biography, where Master's... That man was driving him across the country, was running down rabbits on purpose. He was driving Master in the car, and he's running over rabbits on purpose, and Master tells him to stop, and he doesn't want to stop. That's worse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a bloodlust. You know, just enjoying taking the life of small creatures is entirely different. But even then, when we realize our error, the point at that point is to repudiate it, not to... Um, uh, uh, identify so deeply with it. It's very tricky to be really free of something, to recognize it for what it is and then be free of it and not think that we're... Well, that was that, that uh, sister who left to get married, Sister Tara, that's who it was. Master told her not to do it and she went and did it anyway. And the marriage proved to be a disaster and then she returned to Mount Washington with her child. And... One of the sisters self-righteously said to Tara, how dare you come back after disobeying Master like that? And she answered perfectly, do you want me to worship my mistake for the rest of my life? But you see, that's what you're doing when you're being guilty. You've taken a wrong action and you've put it at the center of your consciousness and then your consciousness just revolves around it. You're worshiping it. All your energy keeps going back into it. I mean, where does that help us? That just takes the first error and then makes a completely different one on top of it. Guilt is a very tricky business and of absolute, absolutely useless and has nothing to do with spiritual growth. It's your ego trying to persuade you. Let's not actually spend our energy changing. Let's just shift our focus. And that just doesn't do you any good. Shift our focus to another dimension of the ego. That was, and I'll just finish, since I, you've heard these before, but they bear repeating. When Seva was days later still in a mood, and Swami asked her why, 
because she had done something rather thoughtless and had caused a certain inconvenience for Swamiji. Just, I, it was one situation where there was a lot of people around. She made some comment or said something that, that rippled back, and then he had to kind of straighten out the confusion. That was essentially the event. Yeah, but she had just careless, made a careless remark, and she was careless. You know. Four or five days later, she's still in a mood. Swami says, what, is, what are you so moody about? Oh, I feel so badly about what I did the other day. He said, what egoism? She said, what? I mean, I thought I was like diminishing my ego here. He said, no. He said that you're so shocked that you could make a mistake that days later you're still thinking about it. And that one has always been really interesting to me because as these things have loosened their hold on me, I begin to realize that is what it's about. So if I do something, which, you know, one does on a regular basis, that is really was not such a good idea, it's like, yeah, so it was not such a good idea. And I could suddenly see that that, that is really the kernel of it, that it's so horrifying to have, to, to have been revealed to be imperfect that you have to spend all your time contemplating it. Whereas true humility is like, why is this so shocking? I remember once, this was one of my absolute favorite responses to criticism. A friend of mine, this is my own response, my favorite of my responses. uh, Somebody was uh, very critical of everything that I was doing here and in my position and decided that they owed it to me to make sure that I understood how unfortunate it was that I had so much influence and responsibility. (laughs) These things happen periodically. And they sat in, the person sat in front of me and explained rather, you know, completely and rather accurately all my shortcomings. And my response was, do you think if I knew how to do this job, I would still be doing it? And it was just so obvious to me, of course I don't know how to do it. When I get it perfect, I don't think I'll have it anymore. So like, why are we so surprised? And afterwards, I was so proud of myself. I mean, in the right way, it's like, Okay. It's unfortunate. It's not, you know, I'm sorry for you that you have to put up with it. There are places you could move to. <laughs> One man came to me once. This was, my, this was my second favorite experience. Maybe my first. He said, a lot of people find you inspiring, but I don't. <laughs> I said, oh, you poor soul. And I talk all the time. (laughs) I really did. I felt so sorry for him. Sunday service after Sunday service. It was just such a misery for him. He was so disarmed, he began to laugh. What could he say? What could I say? (laughs) Give me an idea how to be better. I'll be better. Go ahead. So going back to what you said about guilt is not a correction for a wrong answer. You need to calmly recognize it and resolve to do better. It's so not the it, antidote. Guilt not is not the, the antidote right. to delusion. Okay. Right. So, but it's hard to just stop feeling guilty. Oh. So what you want to do is redirect the energy somewhere else, I would assume, because that's usually what we try and do. If we're putting a lot of uh-huh. energy into something else, you just find something better to put energy into. Right. And it naturally sucks the energy away. Right. But it doesn't feel, it, it seems like I can go, yep, I did that wrong, I'll do better next time, and then that doesn't take very long, and then guilt can go on for a long time. So it doesn't feel like that's really a, an easy way to haul all the energy away from the guilty part of me. Well, what you're asking is what are the techniques for overcoming guilt, is what you're actually saying. Right. Because just the, the mere repudiation of it, it often laughs at you when you just merely repudiate it. Is that Right, or even if I honestly recognize that it doesn't feel so opposite to guilt that I can't also feel guilty for having done it. <laughs> Simultaneously. Um, the, answer to that is, the answer to that is everything that you do on the spiritual path, quite seriously. I think a lot of Swami's songs are a very good antidote to guilt because they change your vibration completely. Anything that makes you joyful and makes you feel expansive. And so service is, I mean, every single, single thing you can name on the spiritual path To my way of thinking, and this is, you know, this is not necessarily everybody's way because I have a very active mind and I have a very conceptual mind. You know, I like to get the concept clear. Even if 
the feeling persists, I can always just kind of be quietly battling it. There's a difference between always being, always kn knowing that you have fallen into a hole that you don't want to be in is quite different from falling in, in the hole and then beginning to, you know, decorate it and bring your books in and make your bed down there. So it, it's like things can linger. Because um, some, kind, some guilts are like, well, like family guilt, like responsibility, for example, for your parents' happiness, or a deep feeling of uh, that you've disappointed someone, and there's no way to fix it. And I mean, family guilt I mentioned because that which is sort of bred into you from your subconscious is really deep, or it comes, it's come from another life and you don't really quite know why you have it. I talked to someone who fundamentally feels responsible for the ecological condition of the planet. Now that's a big one to carry, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so they're sort of walking around all the time feeling they ought to be fixing the planet. That's a little hard to shake. And who knows where such thoughts come from? You know, maybe in some previous incarnation they followed some path that really did have terrible consequences. And even if they're not responsible for the whole planet, they may really have done something that they now realize they really shouldn't have done. So you don't always know the source. So, so some, some is obvious, but some is really deep-seated. And you just, it's like you just have to keep pulling in the opposite direction. And it's, it's one of those things where you keep pulling in the opposite direction and gradually you change. I, I'm certainly living proof of that. And I don't actually know when it began to shift because some of the things I'm telling you, Swamiji, told me in the early 70s. And I always remembered them and I always knew they were true. But some of them I just kept... Um, I always knew that they had to be true, let me phrase it differently. But I didn't actually know that they were true. I just struggled. So that's really, there's no other answer to that. But it helps me at least to have the concept straight. Because then I, once, once the wheels start turning, I think there's something wrong here. At least you can try to unravel it. And japa and affirmations are enormously helpful. I mean, anything that is a, is a mental tape is greatly aided by another mental tape. And, so, and that mental tape is not necessarily even related to the wrong one. It's a replacement. Because you see, it only exists inside your head. There's no thing, there's no material object like this. I mean, there's not even like a, a, a lump of something in your tummy. It's just, it's just a vibration in your head. Shift the vibration in your head and you don't have it anymore until the vritti gets a hold of the ping pong ball of your attention again and then starts sucking it. But just get that attentive somewhere else. Thus, selfless service. You know, thus devotion, thus prayer chanting everything that we do. And depending on how fierce the uh, attachment to being guilty is, depends on how fierce the effort to overcome it has to be. Yes? Well, well um, when I feel guilty, if I, f if, it's be if I feel guilty because I've hurt somebody else, I've hurt their feelings, you know, um, then I, I finally, oh, it's so hard sometimes, apologize or talk to the person. And, um, you, and, and I've been really lucky that people have just, you know, like forgiven me. I know. Or, or we were able to talk it through. And mm -hmm. then I, so then I know next time not to be doing what I did the first time and try. So, but some guilt is just, like I felt guilty when, when you came in and the water thing was empty. Yeah, that's a little exaggerated. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, so so. I'm, but you're just talking about the fact that you have a bad habit. Well, but it's not even me personally. I've I've come to all these things that happen in the, in the office. I'm realizing it's a collective responsibility, and why should I take on the whole responsibility? What? Every one of us in there really ought to be making sure. Yes, that that and water and thing besides is that. There's a huge difference between being responsible and feeling guilty. Yeah. Guilty just is, is an exaggerated egoic response. Yeah. It's just as if like the whole planet depends on me. That was that uh, conversation between Ramakrishna and that gentleman who was talking about all the money he gave and all the, the things that happened because of all the money he gave. And Ramakrishna, just like a child, said, my, 
I wonder how God got along before you were here to help him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and, but he wasn't being sarcastic. He was just interested. He was just responding honestly to this man's belief that everything good was because of him. And Ramakrishna raised a genuine question. <laughs> so it's just like, it's, a, it's just how you have to ask yourself, is it? And, and it's a habit. And you see, however we phrase it, it's just a habit of being too self-concerned. It was just always referring what happens back to you, to you. I mean, I walked in, the water wasn't there, and it was like, I didn't think to refer it to you. Even if you had forgotten to fill it, it was like, it's, it's just, there's just no water here. Nobody, no ego has to own this fact. And, and so when the ego gets in the habit of owning all facts, like, I am responsible for my mother's happiness, I am responsible for my father's happiness, I am responsible for living up to what other people expect me to do. I'm not. That doesn't change the facts. I may still be messing up in a colossal fashion. But that guilt is different than, than delusion, than, than mistakes. Larry has a question. Can we let it go? So something that I heard a while back um, related to guilt, which was, I found helpful, is the, terms, the term sin in religion, which, of course, has a guilt connotation. If you look it up in the dictionary, it's actually an archery term, and it literally means to miss the mark. Huh, and excellent. so the way I've thought of it is, uh-huh. okay, if I've, like, there's really no such thing as quote, sin, if I make a mistake, you know, I miss the mark, hopefully I learn from it, I do better next time. Right. And that's, it's not, a, it's not an all cure, but I found it a helpful perspective for me. No, it's, a very, it's a very good perspective. It just, we just missed the mark. It implies, it's, it implies that you're trying, and it also, again, this goes back to what Swami said to Seva all those 45 years ago. You know, if you're sitting there and you're trying to learn to shoot and you miss the mark, you don't then just say, well, I guess that's it for me. You just pick it up again and you try it again. Guilt is, is just falling on the ground and becoming hysterical because you missed the mark. Oh, I forgot to put the water in there. Well, okay, so I'll put the water in there. You know, I mean, you can't say this when Shanti's around because she's a medical doctor, but for most of the rest of us, nobody dies when we make a mistake. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you can just go on from there. It'll just, you know, go forward from that point. Getting that lighthearted attitude to your own failings, I mean, these are, I mean, these are attitudes that will, that if you don't solve this, this will take you off the path. You know, there's, there's certain things that are kind of a, a, a ball and chain, and you'll, you can drag it. You can just drag it for the next so many years. It'll just come behind you. But there's other things that will cause you to leave the path. And guilt is one, and not having a resolution because, as my friend said to me, you know, I was a perfectionist before, but now I'm trying to be infinitely perfect. I mean, the pressure. <laughs> it, many, many years ago, in the yoga journal, when we were all just starting all this in the 70s, there was this article I still remember. Yoga Journal then was more, it wasn't just yoga postures, it was a more interesting magazine. And it was, the article was called The Dark Side of Meditation. And this was the dark side. Many competitive, perfectionist, type A people take up meditation because they're trying to calm themselves down and reduce stress. And then the stress to be infinitely perfect really gets them. That's the dark side of meditation, right? But it was a serious article. But in fact, you, people will run away from the spiritual path because when they can't live up to this imaginary idea of who they're supposed to be, they will just leave the whole situation altogether because they just can't stand to have to face that all the time. So it first has to do with being realistic about well, I, who you are. I, I, um, I mean, I've had to suggest this to people because it worked for me. Well, if I can't be perfect, then I will certainly be terrible because what I really don't want to be is just mediocre, which is basically where most of us are hanging out, right? We're really not that good, and, 
really, we're not so bad either. We're just not going to, we're not making a mark anywhere. We're just hanging out in the middle. Nobody's going to notice us on either side. And that's, what, that's the thing we don't want. Because that's real humility. I just don't matter in this story. I'm just really not very important. I'm not really bad and I'm not really good. I'm just here. I'm just a little seed trying to become an apple tree running through this really boring period where I don't have any fruit yet and I'm not cute anymore. <laughs> you know, I was talking to someone once who was a young person I knew who'd been very talented very young and I said, well, you have just a few more years to be a prodigy and then you're going to have to be good after that. <laughs> so it's like, we're past being prodigies. We're just ordinary folk in the middle of the story. But it's the mediocre middle. And that is just, I'm just doing what I have to do. It just doesn't matter. Yeah? What about people that get mad at you for not doing something that was your responsibility and they, get, they, get, they just get irate or... Or not even, well, just it depend. doesn't have to be all right for me. And you know it was your responsibility to get something done. Well, you blew it. There you have it. If, they, if they're excessive in their response, that's not your problem. But if you actually were, were, were irresponsible, then you have to say, hmm, I guess I have to try to do better. If they're, you know, the, the entire spiritual path, it's not about them. It's not about who they are and what they're doing. It's how you're responding to it. And the personal... Stand in your own reality and just be comfortable in it is, again, that's the essence of the spiritual path. And that's what we're always being driven to. And I was saying, was it last week or the week before, people who, who leave Ananda because some other person was, you know, just really off the wall. It, it doesn't have anything to do with what anybody else is doing. You're, you're, we do our best. And if our best is lousy, well, there you have it. We probably have other nice qualities. <laughs> and if somebody is excessively unkind about the fact that you're not good at this, well, like I said to that man, you know, he didn't find me inspiring. Oh, you poor soul, you have to listen to me all the time. What can I say? I'm doing my best. I don't get up there and say, oh, let me see if I can bore this audience. <laughs> Keeping track, you know, in my hand of how many are falling asleep. You're doing your best, and you have a whole bunch of responsibilities, and you can't keep them all in your head, and you mess up, and sometimes you make a big mess. What can I say? Everybody has. Everybody's done it. You know, and then you rush like crazy to try to fix it, and sometimes it's unfixable. Oh, wow. And then you have to just say, well, maybe God has a plan that I don't know. And a surprising number of times he does. That's been my formula that I've said to you many times. You either, when you have a lot, of, I have a lot of work, and I worry, I either get it done, or I don't. And sometimes when I don't, it actually is still just fine. It just rolls out in a different way. And I am more who I ought to be, because being a good devotee is not always getting your list finished. Being a good devotee is using your discrimination, being in the flow, being realistic about things, relaxing, just letting it happen the way it's supposed to happen. We should strive for excellence, but when we can't meet it, it's not always a sign of personal failure. I, I, that's the most interesting thing I've learned, is when I don't quite get it. I mean, I used to just stress so much. And now when I, I've noticed that when I don't quite get it together in the way I expected to, there's always another angle coming in. Invariably, there's another angle that it just happens in another way. I know, I, I, I talked to a couple of friends of mine who are very, it's, it's hard if you have a really creative mind, as I was saying to trying to explain to my friend, just because you can think of it doesn't mean you have to do it. It's possible to just say, this is enough. I, that's what I, I call the sort of, uh, at a certain point, if you're doing a big project, for example, or putting on a big event, you know, if you have a creative mind, you can think of, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. But then there's a point at which it'll be 2% better for 15% more effort. And it just doesn't matter. Just because you can think of it doesn't mean it has to be done. And so you just stop and you relax. I came in and there was no water. Did you notice what I did? Oh, my goodness. I know where the water comes from. I picked up the thing. 
<laughs> it's like, wow, I can fill my own water jug. And then you kindly asked, offered to carry it back, which I was more than happy to let you do, although I could have carried it back. But it's like, wow, how awful. She had to, I had to turn on the water myself. It's like, come on, let's get real about this. We're not the only person on the planet. And that, that's what I've watched. over. I've watched that hundreds of times where I thought that I could or should do it, and then for one reason I couldn't and I didn't. And then I just, oh, how interesting. I wonder what God did before I got here. Maybe this. <laughs> you know, he used others. That's not an excuse for laziness, but that is also how you use your discrimination when things happen other than you expect them to happen. Instead of feeling guilty, you just say, well, I wonder what's going to happen next. And you have to say, you have to realize other people have karma. I mean, I used to always feel I had to protect every human being from every other human being. And finally I realized, well, they deserve each other. Just let them have it. You know, let them fight it out. I don't know. If every, every piece of disharmony in the world is not my responsibility. If this one doesn't like that one and they're going to not get along, you know, say, well, what are you going to do about it? And so and so complains mightily about this one because this one is this way. And I have to say, well, what's in it for you to learn? They would never have picked on you if you weren't the right one for them to pick on. And you just begin to realize, oh, I'm not the only person on the planet. Things can just run themselves. Am I really responsible for this? And merely because you can project yourself into it or even have a better solution does not mean you're really responsible. That's how you become sane on the spiritual path. Then the dark side of meditation, and it just doesn't get to you. You just can just sail along and you can stay on the path forever. And then you're much farther ahead than the straw fire who becomes so frantic about everything and then is gone in a couple of years because they can't handle it anymore. The tortoise and the hare, is that the story? Yeah, where the hare burns out and the tortoise is just still there. That's, that's, that's the picture that I always have in my mind is when all the dust settles, I'm still going to be here. <laughs> devotees may come and devotees may go. But my Lord, I will be thine always. And you have to say that to yourself, too. That's a good uh, antidote for guilt, that particular chant. Let's take a short break. All right. Um, I am going to be away the first week in June. So that means there'll be a class next Tuesday. But then the following Tuesday, I'll be gone. But I'll, I'll be gone for like 10 days, but it'll only be one Tuesday because I'm leaving on a Wednesday and returning on a Monday. So it's the first Tuesday. <laughs> it's the least I could do, actually. <laughs> so it'll be the first two. No, wait, is that correct? Yes, the first Tuesday in June because I leave on the last days of May. The, as the, they don't really have words, do they? The last days of May. The last bright, sunny days of May. Okay. Very. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> I was going to enjoy the trip, but now the guilt burden is just so intense. And when Tuesday comes, oh, Lord, there's just no telling it's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going... going um, I told you this. I think the, um, our book distributor is very enthusiastic about the Ask Asha book, which is just being printed. And it will be available soon. I don't know exactly where it is. It got caught. Oh, they were supposed to have it this weekend at the village, but it got caught in customs. They couldn't get it out of customs because it comes from Hong Kong. That would have been fun. Um, so it, very soon we'll have it in our hands. And uh, so the book rep is very enthusiastic about that book. So after I talked to Skip on the phone about why am I going all the way to New York, it's primarily to shake this guy's hands and say, go, sell this book. And that's, and it was... So I'm going to sit in the booth and autograph. Bharat and I are going to sit there and autograph books. And, yeah, we're having a little, little book launch. And then once I was all the way out there, I called the uh, East Coast. There's a small item, a small flying thing, yeah. Um, I called the Rhode Island and the Boston and the New York people, the little northeast there. So I'm going to tootle around to those places for a few days. Yeah, we're going to do that walking pilgrimage in Boston that people do sometime where you go see the places that Master was, yeah. So oh, that'll be fun. Uh, yeah, Darshana, well they, but they're just going to the booksellers thing. They're not staying for the time afterwards. 
yeah, Darshan and Avital, Gurdas and Nicole, Bharat and Anandi actually, because Bharat has new books coming out too. So he and I will be authors in residence in our booth. Uh, he, I don't, it's not clear to me whether this is a new book or whether they've simply revised. I think, I think the book is called something like Earth and Sky Touched Me. Rewrite and redesign. They were he's they're reissuing Sharing Nature itself. There was I guess Sharing Nature one and two, and he's put them into one book. One and they've redesigned. It. However, that's not ready for this one. So he's he's going with some other books for this. They they thought they'd hoped to have it ready, but it's not turning out to be so. Stephen, just comment on the book selling today. Uh, Jill, it's by your feet. Uh huh. This is a comment on the Booksellers Convention. Uh -huh. When I first came to Palo Alto and I was with East West, I went to the Booksellers Convention in uh -huh. Los Angeles and Swami was there. Right. And it was a really fascinating experience to see him there. Uh -huh. It's a Crystal Clarity booth, very similar. Uh -huh. He had just um, finished the album Secrets of Life. Uh -huh. Oh, he kept putting the headphones on So yes, yeah, so, so uh -huh. he was just this presence uh -huh. in this little booth. Uh -huh. Every person who would come by he would, he would have these headphones, he was just beaming, and he would put these headphones on your ears uh -huh. and say, listen to this. Uh -huh. And it was just an amazing thing. And I, you know, it took me a while to kind of, like years actually, uh -huh. to sort of get the appropriate perspective on it, but it made such an impression on me, his yeah. level of enthusiasm. Yeah, his childlike, childlike enthusiasm Absolutely. is what he actually had. That's not sweet. Well, we'll see what happens when I go. Yeah. <laughs> I, re I remember also from the Booksellers Association, one of them, you know, Swamiji is so totally out of the popular media. He, somebody introduced him to uh, uh, King. What's the first name of the? Larry, Larry. Larry King. Larry King. Somebody introduces him to Larry King. Swami didn't have the foggiest idea who Larry King was, but he's introduced to him, and Larry King is wearing his characteristic suspenders and bow tie. Swami's introduced, and then he looks right at him, and he said, you must be very, very famous in order to be able to dress like that. <laughs> Just, I think he essentially said yes. <laughs> but I don't really know exactly. I mean, he took it just like that was exactly the truth. He could. He could just make his own rules. <laughs> Swami didn't, you know, he didn't know. He didn't know who he was dealing with, but he, he got the vibe. I'm sure he also got the vibe that, yes, hello, Swami Kriyananda, I'm very famous. <laughs> <laughs> I said he got the vibe, you know, that when Larry King himself met Swami, that Larry is conscious of the fact that he is famous. He knows he's famous. I'm here and I'm famous. <laughs> That was, you know, Swamiji was so fond of telling that story of when he was at some spiritual fair or another and he was ch chatting with this woman for a while and then she asked, he asked her name and she gave it to him and then she asked his name, she didn't recognize him. And he said, Swami Kriyananda. And she says, but you're famous, like that. And Swami always tells the story and he says, well, I don't know whether I am or not, but why do you say but? Or famous. Well, you don't seem famous. <laughs> and of course, Swami went on to say he didn't seem self-important. Which so many people who are famous are very self-important, and they get a lot of. Uh, they are very identified with being famous, and thinks that makes them something else. Swami thought it was a great compliment that that he they didn't think so at all. What was it that happened uh, when there was? There was some big event, I think it was somewhere in, it might have been New York City, and there were a lot of uh, devotees and people around. I can't remember what the event was, it doesn't really matter. And a lot of people were recognizing Swamiji at that particular event. And so they would come up, aren't you? Like that. And he got used to just responding, yes, I am, I'm Swami Kriyananda. And then he went, I think he might have crossed the border into Canada, or he was somewhere, and somebody comes up to him and says, oh, aren't you? And Swami was just about to answer, the director of the Winnipeg Ballet? <laughs> 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 so, 
this always became sort of the joke. Aren't you the director of the Winnipeg Ballet? <laughs> no, I don't think I am. <laughs> yeah, it just, it, 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 it's every, Swamiji was so good at uh, just having fun with things that other people would, would hold dear. And it, it also made it harder for you to um, be serious when it would come to you. Well, yes, I, I, I am actually the author of that cookbook, yes. Not that you <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the words Winnipeg Ballet start going through your head, you know, and all of a sudden you're just back to just being yourself. You can't really go there. So I just also, just to make fun of attitudes, whenever he would see a car he liked, he would always, in a very important point of view, uh, cars were often what it was, but when he would see a design or something, he would say, I approve, just like that, as if the whole world were just waiting to know. I mean, this long, the car would be the, the silliest example because nobody cared what he thought about that car. But pe we live this way all the time. We're thinking that everybody's... Well, yeah, everybody's thinking about us. Ah, not really. <laughs> I hate to be the one to break it to you. Well... Any other questions or thoughts before we barrel on? We have just a few minutes to start the next rounds. <coughs> okay. So now we'll go on. We just did 227. And now we're going on to 228. By the practice of the several limbs of yoga, impurities disappear and the light of pure wisdom and discrimination dawns. That's very closely related to what I was saying earlier about suffering and happiness. Once the ignorance disappears, the happiness is automatic. We're always trying to make ourselves happy, but we have to actually just stop making ourselves unhappy. And once we stop that, then the other is automatic. It's such a peculiar thought and so hard to grasp, but it's so true. That's why people who have, for example, those near-death near experiences in which they suddenly discover that everything is just fine. That woman in Hong Kong, I can't remember her name, who recently wrote a book that was so impressive, that was just her startling realization that that was her message when she came back. She was always trying to be good enough. And she, I mean, her message sounds a little simplistic, but not really, because she really had it that way. We were just, we're fine exactly as we are. And we're loved exactly as we are. And that's the startling part of it. I, I believe I mentioned, but it's, the story that, that Krishnadas told me about, um, that's in the, my book about Swami, that's in the, where he, he went down the tunnel of light when he, he hit his head so hard that he started to leave his body. And he went um, into the company of a being of light. And his articulation of it was so subtle. He said, he, first of all, he said, he, he, he had... He had absolutely no desires in, the, in that moment in time. And he was conscious of the fact that, he, that in normal life, you're always restlessly wanting something. Whether it's, a, whether it's risen to the conscious level or not, one is rarely utterly content. Subconsciously, you're pushing in one direction or another. And he was aware of the fact that for the first time ever, he, he didn't need anything or anyone exactly in the, he was in the now. And then the next thing he realizes that was, was any thought of, <clears throat> of judgment, of just judgment of himself, inadequacy, concern, as he put it, it wasn't merely that I let it go, he said, but in the presence of that light being, such thoughts couldn't arise. They were vaporized by the, by the vibration that he was experiencing. And this is so different even than when we're calm, but just at all your vrittis, your vrittis were dissolved briefly. I mean, he, was, he just completely stepped out of his ego for that period of time, and he was in the light. And that's what happened to the woman from Hong Kong when she went into the light when she was so close to death. Oh, everything's just fine. I just have this false idea that it isn't. And then so she came back and and uh, what was her book is called Dying to Be Me, I think is what it's called. It's a, it's a very clever title because that's what happened to her. She was dying and then she realized she had to die to be herself. Um, 
that's the phrase here, impurities disappear. Impurities are everything that isn't bliss. And then they all just disappear, and then we understand, and our discrimination dawns. These are the seven stages of wisdom that Patanjali mentions before. Did you have a comment? Yeah, that, that um, is reminiscent of stories that are told from time to time about master's effect on people. Well, there, someone will think that they have all kinds of problems and issues, and they're eager to talk to master about them and ask them the questions. And by the time they get him in there, they just they find out when they walk out the door, they totally forgot. They had no more problems, nothing exactly. to ask. It's exactly right, because um, difficulties are a vibration of consciousness, and you change your vibration. That's why, famously, Lahiri Mahashaya would answer every difficulty by saying, practice Kriya. Whatever issue you would bring to him, he would say, practice Kriya, which means change your vibration and those difficulties will be resolved. Just lift your consciousness and those difficulties will be resolved. Swamiji tells us that story in the path of when he fell into a mood and became convinced that Master didn't love him. And he, he tells the whole story about taking the water bottle, which is the theme of our night, the water bottle into Master's room and trying to make a big noise so Master would greet him and Master didn't come out to see him at all. But then he just went, sat in his meditation room, used his willpower and lifted his consciousness. And as soon as he was, he'd, he'd, as soon as he, I think of it as a ping pong ball because ping pong balls are really light. This is my own little image. And I think of the vrittis in our spine. I think of the ping pong ball as the point this is really just a completely feeble image, but it always works for me. The point where we're focused at the moment. And if, if the ping pong ball gets swept into one of these vrittis, it just whirls around there. But if we can just draw it out to here, wherever the ping pong ball is, is where is us for that time. Yeah, you win the prize. And so that's what Swami, he just, it, it, had, it had sunk into a vritti of what about me, he doesn't really love me, everything. I, and then he got, got it back to here, got his attention back to the point between the eyebrows, and all of a sudden the whole world looked different. Well, of course, it's just the, he's busy. He can't be holding the hand of every single disciple every minute. He just felt vibration shifted. Change our level of consciousness. Do Kriya. Love God. Serve. I mean, he's very, Swami's very powerful at meditation. Some of us, depending on how, um, how imprisoned the ping-pong ball is. You don't have the willpower to break it with meditation, but you can break it by doing something more active that will shift your attention, and then you can come back to that. But meditation is the most direct way to do it. Energization works really well. And service works really well, and physical activity works really well. You really, you develop, you develop a little arsenal, a little menu. And you just, just try them one after the other. I started, I started swimming, which I've been doing now for 15 or more years. It must be a little longer. We yeah, almost probably close to 20. At, after we had a, some kind of a meeting um, with the board of directors of SRF in the middle of the lawsuit. I'm not sure exactly which one of those meetings it was. It doesn't really matter. Afterwards, I was... I was so, you know, <laughs> everything about my nervous system. I, it might have been the meeting in which they pretended to reconcile with us, which was a really a mind-blowing meeting. And I was just so, all of us, we just didn't know what to do with ourselves because there's so much had happened. So everybody else went into the gym, but I didn't have the right shoes, so I, they wouldn't let me in the gym. So I always describe it. I threw myself into the swimming pool, <laughs> and I just, you know, went from one end of the pool to the other back and forth, and I discovered the physiological link of stress between mental attitude and the way you feel. And I discovered that, that you can break, that, that, that a great deal of suffering gets planted in your body. And if you can interrupt that cycle of the stress building up, then it never really gets to be so lodged in your mind. And for, for many years afterwards, I would just, whenever I would find myself becoming edgy, as I described it, I would go throw myself in the pool because then I could swim and I could interrupt the physiological development of a sense of stress. And then it would never lodge in my mind. And it just became, 
one of those things that, you know, you have on the menu. Chant, energize, throw self in swimming pool. You know, just like this. And Earl Grey tea is on that list too sometimes, you know. But, but it's just like, I just need to shift the energy. And you, if you can't just sit down in your meditation room and bring your attention to the point between the eyebrows and have everything fall away, if you can, do that. But if that doesn't work, you need to have a fallback position. No matter how, how small it gets down here, eat chocolate. You know, if it works, it works. That's why I have Earl Grey on the list, too. Sometimes it's just, oh, I just, you know, I can't do anything. I'm so tired. I don't have a brain. I can't concentrate. Nothing's going to happen. I just go have a little tea. Personality in a cup. <laughs> Everything's just fine again. Sometimes I'll realize I've only drunk a half an inch of it, but somehow it's persuaded me that I have energy again and I can do it. Shivani, I traveled all, you know, all over India with Shivani, who is the most energetic, determined human perhaps on the planet. I don't think the planet's big enough to have two of them. And every time there was a lull in the action, I'd see Shivani would be energizing. <laughs> but sometimes I would want to say, have mercy on us, sister, don't energize anymore. <laughs> but she would be there. And I mean, my gosh, that woman would move. She's, you know, just moved the planet, made the movie happen. Just always pulling the energy in. <laughs> well, that may be the end of the evening. Unless there's a question or comment, we will call it a night. Okay. Thank you all very much. Bless you.